Welcome to the Mad and Crypt Theology podcast. We're so happy that you joined us here today. And Miriam and I were talking before the episode, we don't have too many announcements today. So we're just going to get right into our conversation with Keith and Emily. So I'm going to ask you both to introduce yourselves for our listeners. So would you mind starting us off, Emily, and introducing yourself? Sure. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I am uh, Reverend Emily Duggan, a minister of um, a two-point charge in Catalonia and Lewisburg, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. And uh, my husband, Tim, and I live in Lewisburg with our two kids, Grace and Gus. And uh, Grace is the subject of my piece of writing, but uh, I'm sure I'll talk more about her later. Thanks so much, Emily and Keith. Welcome. Thanks, Amy. It's such a treat to be here with you. I really appreciate the invitation. I'm uh, I'm Keith Reynolds. I'm a father, a son, a brother, a friend, and a minister at Avondale United Church, which is in Stratford, Ontario. And uh, the piece that I wrote. Um, had uh, a little bit to do with my connection with Larsh, which I've been a friend of for for 30 years now, I guess. So it's it's great to have a chance to be part of this conversation. And I really look forward to engaging with you, Emily. I, I really valued what you wrote and the things that you offered, not only to me personally, but to uh, to a much wider audience that the journal provides. Yeah, I'm uh, more happy to to have you both, and I'm happy to have United Church well represented on this episode. Um, we wondered if you can both briefly summarize your pieces for folk who may not have. But um, yet, so Keith, maybe you can do that. Sure, thanks, Miriam. The piece that I wrote was uh, a little bit of a creative nonfiction writing that engaged a relationship I have with a woman named Terry from Larsh. Uh, in addition to being a friend of Larsh, Terry also is a friend of Avondale. Avondale is her home church and has been for many, many years. And I found that once I came to Avondale as their minister about a little over six years ago, I discovered how deeply rooted Terry was as part of the community. And over the time getting to know her, I observed and witnessed all that she brought to the community in terms of care, both receiving the care, the care from community, but the special the thing that I noticed especially was the care that she offered the Avondale community. And that's what I tried to focus on in the writing. Thank Emily. Emily and I have been punched for <sighs> Over a decade at least, so um, I was delighted to have you. When Grace was born, and delighted to hear more about Grace and Gus over the young life. So, Emily, can you share a bit about your piece? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was such an honor. I think Miriam kind of nudged me to to write something when uh, when um, she shared that there was a caregiver um, issue coming out. So um, I'm really grateful for Miriam uh, giving me that nudge because this this piece was really important for me and um, helpful, I think, in my own processing and, and in my own, um, you know, in, in unpacking my own uh, role as a caregiver. And so that 
that was kind of the point of the piece and talking about my experience as a caregiver to my daughter, Grace. Um, just a quick, quick background on Grace. She's seven years old now, but when she was only um, just shy of five months old, she was, uh, she began having seizures and was diagnosed well, eventually, um, through a bit of a medical journey, diagnosed with a rare genetic condition called Fox G1 syndrome. And uh, so um, as we began our medical journey, I was uh, given that this piece of writing called Welcome to Holland. And um, it's always been something that's been on my mind and kind of bothered me for some reason. I never really um, understood why necessarily, but I, I wanted to think a little bit more about that and about what our life, um, life as a caregiver and, and how we, um, what those supportive spaces for caregivers um, has been like, um, you know, especially raising a child with a complex medical condition where uh, it, it's called, you know, there's there's complexities for her life, but there's complexities for how her care is is um, understood as well. So I want I, this piece of writing was a, a way for me to just think a little bit more deeply about that and uh, yeah, and, and what it means to to offer support. Thank you so much, both of you, for those summaries. And um, we, as our listeners know, we usually prepare questions in advance for to talk to you about. So we wanted to ask you a little bit about your experiences of being clergy today. So we we're wondering, um, what do you want other clergy to know about caregiving from your pieces? Keith, would you mind getting us started? Sure, thanks, Amy. What a great question to launch things off. I honestly, I the vocation of ministry is so vast and varied that I think the particular story that Emily shares and the particular story that I share are rooted in in contexts that are are personal and unique, while at the same time might offer some some universal components that people might find a landing spot in. And so I guess for my relationship with Terry and what I noticed through Terry about what she offers a community is, I think the, the invitation to pay attention, the, the encouragement to slow down and the awareness that each of us has a gift to bring as flawed and wonderful as those gifts are, that it's an opportunity for us as clergy to not only be attentive to those gifts and the unique value and dignity of each person, but try to discover ways on how we might cultivate those gifts in the setting of the communities in which we find ourselves. My community happens to be a church setting, a community of faith. And so paying attention for me is how Terry's invited me into being a minister differently and trying to listen and see and learn and grow and ultimately to have my heart opened to a reality that I didn't anticipate or a, a way of being a minister that I, I didn't map out or control or have some strategic plan for that it it's ultimately about relationships for me as in my vocation as a minister. And I would, I would encourage clergy in general uh, to, uh, to listen to how those mutually transforming relationships can open our hearts to ministries that may not be expected. And yet at the same time, invite us into a much deeper, richer soil that God's planted us in. Keith, how do you, this is kind of an on the fly question, but could, do you have any thoughts about how your um, time at L'Arche has um, given you some insights into how to uh, minister to Terry or provide care to her? L'Arche has been really formative for me, Amy. I, I would say in large part because it was timing. I, I lived in L'Arche while I was going 
through school studying for ministry. And so that combination nurtured things from a very early time on. Um, but I would say that one of the core values of L'Arche is mutually transforming relationships, that it isn't, a, it isn't a strictly care, caregiver, care receiver role, that there are moments where uh, I will be asked to be the caregiver and, and that's my role and I'm happy to offer that. One of the mysteries of L'Arche that has taught me over the years and con continually does so is the opportunities to be open to receiving care. And those things come often surprisingly and in times that are unexpected, uh, but it's that it's that openness to being transformed by these mutual relationships that honor the gift in each other and honor the authentic witness that each of us provides as people, but also in the context of a community where relationships are held beyond simply just me and you, but that we belong to something bigger than ourselves. And that belonging to something bigger is part of that transformation process that hopefully helps us become more human. Thanks so much for that, Keith. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, Emily, would you be able to share with us what you uh, want clergy to know about caregiving from your piece? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, I've been thinking about this question and I, I don't know if there's something in particular, um, but I know that, um, I know that for, I think my, um, my pastoral care role has been impacted by my own role as a caregiver, because especially if someone's going through um, medical challenges or, or facing their own medical complexities I think I it, you know I have a better much better understanding of, of the kind of layers and 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 challenges that are involved and um, I think you know I think I think that's definitely helped me in my own um, my own ministry and and I would hope that that maybe um, other clergy might you know, just be able to to think about what what that's like for for folks going going through um, going through that, um, I think too. Um, I mean, I'm so grateful for the uh, what I've learned about advocacy from the United Church. I mean, I feel like the first time I wrote uh, a letter in a letter writing campaign was in the United Church in the United Church setting. So I know that clergy are you know prepared to do that advocacy work. And, and so I, I hope that that might be um, something that they could um, use in, in everyday settings. I mean, especially for supporting families. And, and I think that's, you know, I think that's one of the things I've um, not felt the most lacking, but just felt um, so isolated in being, able to um, use that role of advocacy and and wish that there was more um, more support in that way I wish there was uh, a larger voice of, of people to to be a part of that and I, and I think clergy have the the skills and the you know the the calling in in their work that uh, that could be a very critically supportive role to play. So um, I, I think that would be one of the, the, my, the hopes that I would have to, to encourage clergy to, to be able to, to offer. And Emily, we wanted to ask you as a, a follow-up question for you, how did you, um, how have you had your clergy colleagues care for you as you are caring for Grace and your other family members? Um, and how, what other ideas do you have or, or wishes that you have that clergy could 
ways that clergy could care for you. I have, it's been such a gift to have so many clergy friends because um, I know when I, when all of Grace's um, health concerns were unfolding, I was still on maternity leave and had time, I guess, in a way, to, to be able to, to work through the initial phases of Grace's health concerns. I mean, looking back, I probably should have taken some medical leave on top of <laughs> my maternity leave, but I didn't, you know, didn't do that. But anyway, um, but when I was went back to work, I had friends and colleagues send, you know, full worship services or send um, liturgical resources and things that could help, especially on um, in, in really busy and overwhelming times. And that was such a gift because um, I've always sort of in, in ministry, I've always believed that we could be doing a much better collaborative uh work around supporting one another. I mean, it's, uh, so that was such a gift. And so many of my colleagues did reach out and offer um, just, you know, personal support, a shoulder to, to lean on and, and, and listening ear. Um, and um, I think that was, you know, that was important and, and it was welcomed and needed. <laughs> Yeah, that that's awesome to hear. Um we we wondered uh Keith, you in your piece you shared this beautiful image how to embody care. And you later on in your piece admit with care there can be time repair too, which like out of our own humanity and we we think we know the attentions we've been when they should tap about time and power and so on. And we wondered how you sit with or sit in the messiness of here and, and navigate those beautiful moments and those fairness. Thanks, Miriam. That's a great question. I would honestly say not all that well sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sitting in the mess of things is hard. It's challenging. It it takes me to a place that I, I don't want to go. Uh, it, it has me look at myself in a different way than I would have wanted myself to be or believed myself to be. And so sitting with that mess of failure, uh, I think is a is an opportunity to to dwell in in the gift and the wound of being human. I mean that the wonderful thing about human is none of us are perfect and the desire for perfection is not going to lead us to being a greater caregiver. At least it never has for me. So maybe others know how to navigate that better than I do. But I think in, in your and Amy's editorial that you wrote in this issue, being present with the mess and the, and the disruption, I think says it well, that there is a kind of summons to being present. And what that means to me about being present is, is not to be distracted, to notice, to take the time to sit with it and all the discomfort and dis-ease that it, it asks of each one of us. And then somehow in that deeper level to trust that there's a, 
there's a deeper reality. There's a hidden gift. There's a undiscovered grace that's waiting to be given. And I can't manufacture it. I can't control it. I can't manipulate it. But when I trust that even in the mess and the failure of difficult relationships and caring, that there's 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 something below that, around it, within it, that if I'm present and patient and allow that to have room to move on its own, then I, I somehow become met by that. I, I don't do anything to make that happen. And that's why I, I guess I ended with describing it as grace, because that's how often I, I encounter God. So I think it's, it's somewhat fitting we're having this conversation with a daughter of Emily, whose name is Grace, right? Like, like there's something that Grace offers as a person of faith for me that I, I find often in the celebration and the wonder and the great, joyful, happy moments of life. And the, the reality of grace for me is, is felt more deeply uh, and resonates with a, a stronger tune when I encounter the mess of life and living and relationships. So I'm, I'm trying to learn to be more grateful <laughs> yeah uh, yeah we can be grateful all the time <laughs> yeah but yeah. I I thank God for God's question in many in many moments so thank you for naming that. Mm. Thank you. Emily, we, the question, next question that we have for you is about um, when you entered this triathlon with Grace, what team of people met you at the arrival gate? And how have you felt that community of care for yourselves and Grace? Um, the, uh, <laughs> I think, I mean, I, I always love to, um, or I, I have to mention my mother because she has been, um, an incredible source of support for us. She's actually a speech pathologist who worked with children and then managed a children's treatment center, uh, for a, a good part of her career. And so when she retired just before Grace was born. And so I, she has been such an incredible resource to rely on because she, she knew the exact supports that we needed, or she, she just, she helped to guide us in a lot of the, the direction that we needed to go for Grace's care. And I, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for that because it's incredibly overwhelming to, um, to look at the amount of, of care that's needed. And I think that there's, um, I don't know if it's something that happens in the medical system where, you know, doctors and, and we've had an incredible team of support for Grace, but this is something they do all the time. And I think they forget that, that parents, new parents, or, you know, caregivers of a newly diagnosed complex kid, um, this is the first time we've had to deal with any of this. And so I think being able to have my mom there navigating or helping us to navigate through that was so, um, was so important. And then we had, um, I mean, I, Keith, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned um, how Grace's name <laughs> does is pretty incredible because it, it does remind you of grace and and we have received just so much grace for grace <laughs> like during long hospital stays or extended uh, periods of of intensive care for grace we'd get a text message from a congregation member saying you know 
I left some food on your back step, you know, like it's there waiting for you when you get home, you know, or, or the number of times that people just stepped up to, um, to offer that kind of care was, it was amazing. Um, and um, so I, I think, you know, that, that team of people, <laughs> we, we've been, um, yeah, we've had, we've had a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of support in that way. That is awesome to hear. I love it when people drop off food. That's like the best. <laughs> um, we wanted to ask you as well, uh, Emily, if you could share uh, how stories in the Christian tradition uh, shape your care and advocacy for grace. Are there any that are special to you? Um, you know, I, I made a couple of references in the piece to the um, the caregivers of the the man who was paralyzed and the kind of um, lengths that they go to 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 seek the support that he needs. Um, another passage that I, I love is the the story of Ruth and the kind of um, solidarity and and um, advocacy role that that Ruth plays and in, in in never giving up. And, and I think that that's been, um, for me, um, you know, I, I, it's entering this journey as Grace's, as Grace's mom and her caregiver. I mean, I'm never giving up on her and, you know, it's, it's, um, so easy to love and care for her because she's the greatest joy of my life. Um, but you know, it's it's having those people in your corner who who also offer that that care and and connection for us. Um, and so I I think that that wherever you will go, I will go is uh, been my <laughs> sort of um, uplifted me, but also uh, been a reminder that this is it's not we're not alone in doing this. We we need the we need those people who say, I'm with you and I'm not giving up on this. And uh, hmm, I think those are the, the, the type of illustrations from, from the Christian tradition that, that I would be drawn to. Yeah, those are gorgeous, gorgeous stories to John. Um we that, that's maybe we invite the authors to chat to each other. So you put you read each other's pieces and heard each other reflect some more so we wondered if you had Questions or thoughts or care for one another. So maybe Emily can begin if. Yeah. Yeah, Keith, thank you so much for, for your piece. And um, I loved the, um, I loved that image. I think that Miriam mentioned earlier of Terry embodying um, grace. And I think it's, it's so, it was um, helpful for me to hear the experiences of Terry in a worshiping community because I, we actually don't bring grace to church on Sunday mornings. Um, <laughs> mostly just because of the amount of effort that it takes. I'm obviously in a leadership role, so I can't be caring for her while church is taking place. And, you know, we also have a, you know, very busy toddler. Um, <laughs> and so for, for my husband to pack the kids up and bring them to church, it's just a lot of work. But, um, but I also think I, you know, I think we are concerned about the kind of um, reception that Grace receives when we do bring her to church. She's, you know, she has uncontrolled vocalizations and 
um, you know, isn't uh, a typical able-bodied worshiper. And um, I think, you know, there's hesitance or worry or, um, I, you know, and I, I just wondered about um, what you would say or offer as a, um, a way of making those spaces in church settings. <laughs> Yeah, one wonderful question, Emily. Um, I mean, you're living the reality, right? Like you, you and your family are embodying that hospitable invitation for a community to respond to. Uh, and so I, I hope just in in how you've highlighted advocacy as being a, a significant thing for you as a parent for Grace. I would hope that there might be some folks in the congregation that would see you folks as a family as an opportunity for their advocacy. And I, I guess when I think of advocacy in the context of a community, it would, it would be about how to create a sense of belonging mm -hmm. and how to create a, a, a space where, where people can be welcomed and the particular gifts that people bring can be welcome and, and it's not going to be always neat and tidy and it's not always going to be what church was like when I was a child 50 or 60 years ago or even 10 or 15 years ago and so I I would hope that there might be some folks in the congregation who could make that journey with you and Grace and your family and to uh, to say we want we want there to be space for people like Grace and people like Grace invite us into the mystery of Christian community, which is that we belong to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And, and that's a nice connection with the question I was going to ask you, Emily. You had a great way of describing um, God's grace being uh, embodied through action. And then you give examples in this conversation of food being dropped off at the door, the way your mother has been uh, a wonderful resource for you and and how you as a family are, are working this through together. You then went on to talk about vulnerability and shared community. And I wondered, that phrase was a really nice uh, image for me, and I wondered if you might be able to articulate or explore a little bit more what vulnerability and shared community looks like, or feels like, or or might sound like. Mm -hmm. um. Oh. Um. <laughs> I think, um, oh, <laughs> uh, that, that's a very good question. <laughs> and I think it, it catches me off guard a little because I'm, uh, um, I don't know, I, I, <laughs> I'm trying to remember where I wrote about that in the piece. <laughs> um, Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You were talking about the um, the disciples witnessing witnessing Jesus after the breaking of the bread, and um, and they knew it was Jesus with them, and so it was the actions that were reminding them of the vulnerability and shared community together. And I thought. What a great image, not only to draw from the gospel there, but what a great image for for we as part of a Christian community that embodying God's actions of grace, but realizing how vulnerability can be an essential part of shared community and how shared community can lead us to a kind of vulnerability that may not be possible in other places. And so I, maybe I wasn't as specific with my question, but I hope that helps a little bit. No, it, it does. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I think that um, 
you know, I, I think that um, Grace has sort of, um, or, you know, being Grace's caregiver has really, um, has really reminded me that, um, you know, there, there are, um, we, <laughs> I don't know how to, I, I, I'm not finding the words to articulate this, but, um, you know, I think we, we all have, uh, we all come from a place of vulnerability and especially as communities of faith. And I think that that is something to see as a gift that we can hold one another in these vulnerabilities. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's always been a struggle for me to talk about Grace's story um, because it's received with so much pity. And I'm, I'm hoping to get beyond that sense of, of pity toward, um, towards something deeper where we can say, this is just a, you know, it, it's it's a different way of being and a beautiful way of being uh, that, you know, Grace has an incredible quality of life in who she is and how she is. And I think that, you know, if as a church, as a, as a community of faith, I think we can, we're much better to, to be able to acknowledge those, those different vulnerabilities and be able to see them as something that we can um you know something that that's that's a gift something that that contributes to the community and um you know i, I think too like i i um i would desire that um that grace would be able to have um you know be able to to be a part of the community for who she is and um and move beyond that sense of um you know like i said pity but or or thinking that she um is only there as someone who needs help or support i would uh, you know i would um envision uh, a a space for us where she is welcomed in for exactly who she is and you know we're we're starting to see that um especially with some of her peers you know at school she's um I, we were so worried about sending her to school because it's a smaller it's a smaller community she's you know maybe the the only kid with the kind of complex care needs um in her her class but the kids are you know, interactions that we see, they're starting to interpret her communication. They're starting to to learn her language of, of saying, oh, you know, that movement or that, um, you know, when she gets happy, she really, her whole body shakes, you know, and so they, they can tell that, that she's happy. And they, uh, we, we saw one interaction in particular where, you know, her arm movements can be pretty random um, in, in how she um, in how she moves her arms around. But one time at the skating rink with her class, she was moving her right arm to the side. And the little kid who was pushing her said, oh, she wants to chase that kid who's just over here. She's pointing at them, you know, and, and those moments of, of, um, of connecting with her were, were beautiful for us to see because we know that there's there's something happening uh, with with the other kids where they they're they're learning beyond just the the typical ways of of being and i think you know that's um i think that's kind of what what i was trying to get at with with vulnerabilities and um being that shared community together yeah thank you Emily. what when I heard from both of you talking about uh, Grace and Ellie, I'm reminded of a word called Tanya Tchaikovsky. 
says in this that brother did others and she writes I'm using her in, in my book. So she writes about uh, people being desired to be in those places. So so I kind of like been on it, but I think desiring in Christian community, we desire to know each other, to, to see God in one another in the community. And for the, to my prayers, for there to be places where we're Christian as are desired to be there. So that's that's what what came to my mind you were talking. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Um it's it's Great hearing about about the the joys of caregiving and the the hard places where we need that community. So, any final comments? I would simply say thank you. Uh, I've found this conversation to be uh, quite wonderful and rich and I and hopeful. I, um, I find the, the work you both are doing, Miriam and Amy, to be uh, quite inspiring and the, the breadth that you're offering to the Canadian context and beyond is is quite hopeful for me. And then having a chance to sit with you like this, Emily, and hear some more of your story. I, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that, uh, that care is being embodied and lived out in some really wonderful ways amidst all of the challenges that come with caring, uh, that, that the embodied witness of caring is, is happening in some, some wide reaching places. So thanks for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. I, I also wanted to say thank you to to both you, Amy and Miriam, uh, for doing this. And, um, you know, the all of the pieces in this issue were I, I haven't had a chance to get through all of them, but I, I it's been such a gift to be able to hear everyone's stories. And and I think um, um, I think having that space to be able to to express, you know, the the role of caregivers and 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 those those complex and 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 you know um, challenging but also joyful and uh, and um, deep moments are it's it's been such a gift for me to be able to share share my experience and. Um, Thank you so much for for making the space for everyone to do that. Great, and we'll see. Hopefully, see more of your work in coming issues. We'll see. Okay, bye for now.